It's Tuesday, it's rainy. I've been up since the crack of 10 a.m. trying to get Harry Styles tickets, failing. I'm in my flop era. Anyway, this week, tomorrow, is my birthday. So I thought I would treat myself and buy a book because I've been trying to not buy any non-secondhand books and just been getting stuff out of the library because there are enough books that exist in the world. But on this occasion, I thought I could get one. So I have bought, it ends with us, Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover, Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover. Everyone in the entire world is reading or has read this book. I am assaulted by this book around every corner. TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, everywhere. Everyone says that this book is amazing. This is not a book I would traditionally buy. It looks terrible. Just the cover, the cover looks terrible. However, I'm willing to give it a try to do something different. Step out of my reading comfort zone. I don't know anything about this book. I didn't even bother reading what it was about. I just thought, why not? It sounds like a depressing relationship. Is Ryle a real name? Wow. There are a lot of italics in this. That's a choice. Now that I've judged it thoroughly, I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna tell you what I thought and whether this book is as it's cracked up to be, if this is gonna blow my mind, change my life, or whether it's another overhyped TikTok book. Let's find out. First thoughts. This reads like a fanfic, which is fine, but was this a fanfic that someone wrote for a fandom and then changed all the names and then published it? I'm just wondering. Also, the main character is called Lily. Her name is Lily Bloom. And her passion is growing things and she dreams of opening a florist shop but she's afraid that if she did, people wouldn't think her desire was authentic. What could be more authentic than a florist called Lily Bloom? Her middle name is Blossom. Her full name is Lily Blossom Bloom. No one would think that was inauthentic. People would be like, oh wow, is that really a real name? And you'd say, yes, it is. And everyone would be like, that's amazing. The stars aligned. The planets all lined up perfectly. It couldn't be better. Your name is Lily Blossom Bloom and you're a florist. I don't know what she's going on about. What's the problem? Weird start.
so something not that chill is happening in this book. I think from here on out, there may be spoilers. Before there are spoilers, I will say, I am delighted that Lily Bloom has decided to start her own floristry business, like I told her she should. I feel like I uh, encouraged her, I supported her, and she's followed my advice, and she's decided to go ahead with her floristry business. So, that's good, I'm happy for her. I do still think she's lacking quite a lot of self-esteem, but she's working on it. She's working on a business, that's good. Apart from that, oof. So I'm on chapter seven, where she goes to the party of Ryle's sister, and at the party, Ryle, and it will never stop being weird saying his name, Ryle picks her up bodily and walks with her to the bedroom, his bedroom, and then he locks the door. This man is insane. Like, you don't even know him. She literally just does not even know him. And then she's like, I won't have sex with you, Ryle. And he's like, okay. So then he takes her dress off and is like, get into bed. What? The vibes are rancid. He took a photo of her the very first time that they met each other and he's blown up that photo and put it on the wall of his apartment. Okay. Okay. I also need to question Lily's weird horniness about scrubs. What's that about? Has she watched too much Grey's Anatomy? Would a neurosurgeon, even a resident, I have watched a lot of Grey's Anatomy. Would a neurosurgery resident wear scrubs outside of the hospital? I don't think so. That seems like a weird thing to do. But also it's very like, I'm a doctor. Did you know I'm a doctor? I'm wearing scrubs because I'm a doctor. I feel like doctors don't actually do that. Especially if you're a neurosurgeon. Because if you're a neurosurgeon, it's enough of a flex that you're a neurosurgeon, you're about to be a neurosurgeon. You don't need to overdo it. I don't think doctors do that, do they? They change. You just change out of your scrubs. Why would you be in your scrubs the whole time? They have like normal clothes. But also, why is she so weird about it? Why is she like, oh my God, he's wearing scrubs. Who finds scrubs hot? Lily, what's up with that? She also, to an almost distressing level, keeps talking about his arms. They're so big. I don't know how he fits those arms in his shirt. Where I'm now starting to picture him as a sort of Popeye figure who like has these giant arms, like a triangle shape. How big would someone's arms have to be for you to constantly make a feature of them? That's a defining characteristic of their appearance. He has fucking huge arms. Okay, and another thing that she also keeps mentioning is the Burberry shirt that he was wearing when she first met him because I'm now imagining that it's like a solid Czech Burberry shirt. It's not like she knew, knew it was a Burberry shirt because it had like a little tiny logo. So I'm imagining that it was a full like Burberry Czech job, which is also hilarious because imagining someone who is in a full Burberry Czech shirt with huge arms, it's just, it's a funny picture, but that's fine. Yeah. I think in terms of where this is going, she should get a restraining order from this man immediately because he's clearly a lunatic and will continue to be so, presumably. It's also really weird with books like this when they 
talk about like people suddenly being obsessed with each other when they literally don't know each other like at all they've spent no time together they've met at this point three times but over a period of like months so a long time passed between the first and the second and the third time that they've met each other and they've spent no time together even during those times so they know nothing about each other and they've never had even like a chat they've never really talked so it's just weird to me how we're supposed to believe that they have this like connection and they're like they're super obsessed with each other and she's like oh i don't know i don't know if i want to sleep with you how good looking is this man I mean, is it just his huge arms? What does he even look like? She's never described him. I have no idea what he looks like or what she looks like, actually. I think she said she had red hair. So apart from her having red hair and him having huge arms, I don't know what they look like. Am I supposed to just cast them in my mind? Is this to make the casting of the movie adaptation, which will inevitably come from this, easier? Hmm. But yeah, I'm maybe a quarter in, a third in, page 94. It's not bad, it's all right, very readable. It's not amazing, it's fine. The way they talk to each other is obviously not like any normal people ever talk. But that's okay, we can suspend our disbelief. So yeah, that's where we're at. a lot of thoughts. I'm a little bit scared because I think this book has stands. I think there are legitimate Colleen Hoover stands who maybe will find me and kill me if I'm mean about this book. And I don't want to be mean about it because I think if people enjoy it, which so many people clearly do, then there is obviously something of value there that is either entertaining or otherwise giving something to people that they're enjoying so much that they're so passionate about. And it's really irrelevant, like, that it didn't work for me especially, because the whole point is that if a book works for you, that's all that matters. But I was really interested by the concept of this book, partially because people are so passionate about it and are so enthusiastic about it. Like, when you see the way people talk about it, they're like, oh my god, I was crying, I was sobbing, I couldn't get over this book for weeks. Everyone's very moved by it and I'm not entirely sure why. I'm not sure I understand what people are crying about. I'm just not sure. Like, at no point did I think it was a crying moment. Is it just that it doesn't work out and that this relationship doesn't work out and that it's sad. Because one of the things that you also see a lot is that this is recommended alongside other romance books. But people are very passionate about saying that it's not a romance. Like when people recommend their favorite novels that are romance adjacent, let's say, I've seen multiple times comments of people jumping in being like, it's not a romance. This book isn't a romance. It ends with us isn't a romance. This book is clearly a romance. Is it just that no one wants to say it's a romance because it's such, for lack of a better word, a toxic relationship and that it is about domestic abuse? 
that doesn't make it not a romance novel. It still very much is a romance novel because without the romance element of this book, there is nothing else there. The entire purpose of this book, of this story, the entire being that exists inside this story is the relationship and the romance between the main two characters. So I cannot comprehend how this would not be a romance because if you took away that element, there is nothing else there. There is no plot other than what's revolving around their relationship and any character development that happens is also alongside and due to their relationship. But aside from that, it's difficult to talk about this without like slamming the writer in a way. This story is obviously very close to her because it's inspired by her mother and her father's relationship. Her father was violent towards her mother. And in the author's note, she talks about her relationship with her father subsequently and how her mother left um, left the marriage and she was quite young but she did subsequently have a relationship with her father and her father was never violent towards her and that's obviously the experience that she's had which is why she wanted to write this book in this particular way the issue that i have with this and i don't want to start trying to do like a feminist text reading about it but it's impossible not to have questions about the message that this sends out. What you say matters, like what you write matters. These stories that become so close to people matter. And especially that it seems it's becoming very popular with people that are very young. I don't think it's necessarily a problem. I don't want to sound like an old person blowharding about like, oh, think of the children. But the message is rancid. Like, I'm sorry, it's horrible. It's just the whole thing is horrible. The whole thing is a romance of this toxic relationship. And I completely understand what I'm supposed to get out of this. Nothing is black and white. How difficult it can be to leave someone when you love them, but they're also violent towards you. And there is abuse in this relationship that otherwise these people are very happy in. So they have this relationship they don't want to put aside. And that's the conflict for the main character. But my issue with it is, is really not actually with the domestic abuse angle, which I think is fine. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. It's there. But actually their whole other relationship, the, the rest of their relationship is a hot mess. So I think it's not really teaching any great lessons if, if, we, if we expect novels to teach us anything i mean hopefully everyone that reads this is able to discard all of that entirely because i really think they should the idea of this relationship is horrendous from the start this man is awful and she doesn't know him at all and from the very beginning it's like they fall into this passionate love affair where they barely know each other. They never talk, they never hang out. They're never just doing stuff. Am I supposed to just imagine that that happened? Because the book specifically, the text, specifically tells me that it doesn't. They essentially meet three or four times and then he like moves in. And then within six months, they decide on a whim to get married. Just one day they decide to get married, which again is fine. Like people get married very quickly. People decide to go off to Vegas. People decide to do all sorts of impulsive things and it works out fine. And maybe it doesn't, and maybe it's something that people regret and then they move on from. It's not a problem. But the way that it's presented, all of these things are relevant plot points to the subsequent development of the abuse storyline, if it's all right to call it that. So all of it is kind of part of what happened. I don't know if I'm supposed to think that actually Ryle was purposely trying to get her into this situation where he very quickly got her into this relationship and very quickly locked it down, got her married 
and subsequently pregnant. If that was part of the plot where he was controlling and coercive and all these other things that quite often come with domestic violence type relationships, then I would maybe understand it. But it doesn't seem to be the case at all. It's just that they impulsively decide to get married and then within that first six months she's married and she's pregnant it felt like it was necessary for her to become married and have this baby for her to be of any value as a person the whole point of that character seemed to be that she had to become a worthwhile member of society a wife and a mother before she deserved to escape this violent man she alone was not enough like for her to be a single as an unmarried a single 25 year old woman that actually didn't seem to be enough for her to deserve to not be abused she says that like all of the things that are her reasons for leaving him are like about the daughter the culmination of the book is essentially her saying to him how would you feel if your daughter said this to you so for some reason the daughter is worth leaving this violent man for but her own life isn't and i think that's just the most terrible way of looking at things it drove me mad like i was so annoyed by it i mean maybe i'm missing the point maybe the whole point is to talk about this kind of cycle with the the children and you know growing up and them being abusive relationships but i just found it to be incredibly ham-fisted like i'm sorry i found it to be ham-fisted another thing that i thought was kind of messed up about this was the explanation behind why he was violent towards her, why he was unable to control his temper. So this is obviously spoilers, um, because of trauma that he experienced in his own childhood, it's kind of explained that after that, he was unable to control himself to the point where he essentially blacks out and he doesn't know what he's doing. And the idea is that when he hurts her, he doesn't actually know he's doing it. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't know he's doing it. He kind of blacks out. It happens. And then afterwards, he's really sorry. Which seemed like, A, very convenient for him, or B, like a made up way to explain why it was so difficult for her to make this decision to leave him. Because what we're trying to establish is that he loves her and he would never hurt her. He loves her, she is the most important thing in his life. But through this unfortunate circumstance where he has these lapses, he is unable to stop himself from hurting her very badly. But what I don't understand is why he is able to, in that case, only target his violent, extremely violent, like very bad, violent anger outbursts at Lily. Because at no point is she ever concerned about her daughter. She is absolutely fine about leaving her baby with this man, that she thinks he's actually a great father. He he loves to see his daughter and he's very happy to, you know, co-parent and she is delighted to co-parent with him and he's a good father. That's kind of how we leave it at the end. Why is she so sure that he won't ever snap and have a rage blackout and throw his daughter against a wall or down the stairs. I don't understand. Because if he did it to her, why wouldn't he do it to the kid? Because he can't control himself. He doesn't do it on purpose, right? He's not aware he's doing it. So then how is he able to control it? Why does he only target the violence at his wife? never explained, never covered. Seems kind of like a plot hole to me. I don't really understand. I, If I were her and 
she truly believed that that was the case, that he could not control himself. It was completely outside of himself. Like he was out of his body, he was out of his mind. And it was something that just happened to him. And he's, he's almost a victim of it. It's like sad that he's a victim of this thing that just takes over him. It's like um, he just hulks out, literally. If she's so sure that that's the case, I don't understand how she wouldn't possibly be worried about her daughter. Aside from that, I also found quite a lot of the actual details around the plot quite baffling and ridiculous. So the first time that he ever hits her is because she's making a casserole in the oven and not knowing that the casserole is hot in the hot oven he reaches in with his bare hand and he pulls it out and burns himself and she laughs and then he pushes her and hits her and in the author's note she actually describes that that is a like a direct um retelling of what happened with her own mother and her father which i completely understand but it really didn't make sense in the context of this story that a surgeon would reach into a hot oven with his bare hands. In the author's note, she says that her dad did it because he was drunk. And that makes perfect sense that a man who is a heavy drinker would reach into an oven and try and pull out a casserole dish and burn himself. But it did not make sense in the context of Lily and Ryle, who had just had like a glass of wine, and he is a surgeon and we're constantly banging on about how incredibly valuable his hands are. That is just idiocy, and he's a neurosurgeon. Things like that, which are really small details, just drove me up the wall because those small details completely break your immersion in the story and make you go what and again i feel like i'm being really horrible by nitpicking this experience that clearly happened to her and she you know she has shared that with the readers and it's obviously important to her but i was reading the novel you know before i got to that stage i was just reading the novel that was written and it was only like in the afterword on the author's note that when I read that, I was like, oh, okay, I see why that was there. But it just, like things like that just broke the immersion for me completely. I also found the whole story with Atlas completely unnecessary, actually. Again, like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm picking all the parts of this book that make it this book and saying, well, that didn't need to happen. If you take away everything that I think was unnecessary, there is no book there which the parts with her reading back her diary about atlas i was genuinely just quite bored i found the like the idea that those were diary entries was completely ridiculous it wasn't written like a diary it wasn't written like a diary of a 15 year old girl it was obviously another way to construct these plot points a way to give backstory to her and to atlas and again why did atlas need to exist why was it necessary for atlas to exist why did this have to end with her and atlas getting together because it's a romance this is a romance novel that's why she has this secondary boyfriend essentially just waiting in the wings she has the romance before at the very problematic age of 15 and 19 i will also mention that age gap is not great then he goes away we have the whole royal storyline and then the second the royal storyline is over she gets herself another stand-in boyfriend and like god forbid God forbid she doesn't have a boyfriend. Like, imagine a character in a romance not having a boyfriend. You can't imagine it because then it wouldn't be a romance novel, which this is. So I found that annoying. Um, I didn't think that the Atlas side of the storyline had any particular interest for me. Every time we flipped back to the diary of the past stuff, I was just like, oh Christ, here we go again. Apparently this is now going to have a prequel about atlas i don't think i'll be reading that i'm not sure i'm particularly interested another thing that annoyed me about this is that it had what i call like chekhov's character development where every single thing that's ever mentioned about 
anyone is then brought up again. There's nothing's ever just a description. Nothing ever just happens. It's like Lily like shuffling cards so that later in the book she can dazzle Ral's friends with her card shuffling skills. Atlas will mention that he likes cooking in the book to then later become a chef. Obviously the whole thing with Lily wanting to have a flower shop. Nothing is ever mentioned that doesn't then have a obvious payoff further down the line. Lily's obsession with scrubs that continued for the entirety of the book. Weird, super weird. Even at the end, once he's been abusive to her and they've like broken up and he comes around to see her, she's like, and oh my God, he was in scrubs. Like what, what? It's never explained why she's obsessed with scrubs. It's just implied that I'll understand why she thinks scrubs are hot. And I mean, when he wore the stethoscope, she nearly passed clean out. And again, that was Chekhov's stethoscope because that stethoscope was not there for no reason. So, yeah. In the end, unfortunately, it ends with us, didn't do it for me. But I had an interesting time trying it out. Thank you for joining me on this exciting journey into a new book and genre, potentially. I have read other romance books, but it's just not something that I massively read a lot of. If you have any suggestions for books that I should try next, hit me up, let me know what you think. Not that love hypothesis one, because I heard that that's a Star Wars fanfic. Not enough money in the world. So not that one. Till next time, goodbye. Bye.